Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining me for another uh, Siemens-based webinar. I think today you'll find it uh, very enlightening. We're going to start to dig into some of the uh, the meat of our standard cycles. Uh, so this will be specific to Shop Mill. Um, we're calling it Shop Mill Working with Standard Cycles. But uh, as you'll see, the mechanism is so similar between this and our program guide or our G-code side that really the majority of what you see here could be applied over to uh, program guide as well. And I probably will do a comparable webinar just like this one um, specific to program guide in the not so distant future. As always, I will be your presenter today, Chris Pollack. I'm the dealer support specialist here on the East Coast. And I do like to give out my contact information because I am a resource for you. So if you guys have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Probably email would be the best. Um, but if you need immediate assistance, you can always try me on my uh, main cell number here. We got a, a couple uh, additional events coming up in the not so distant future. Our next uh, seminar is going to be uh, more shop turn or turning specific. And we're going to start to look at how do I handle ID programming uh, in a lathe. So typically, everything we've done up till now, we've done a bunch of uh, turning webinars, but it's all been kind of based around uh, OD jobs. So I definitely wanted to get a chance to talk about working with ID, some of the uh, unique differences that you have to kind of anticipate. And then after that, we're going to do a, uh, a neat one called uh, trig help functionality. So the, the control, and this would apply to either milling or turning, has the ability of kind of figuring out data points for you if you have limited information. Uh, so this webinar is going to be specific to how does our trig help work, how do I use it in a real world example, so on and so forth. So that's what we have coming up uh, both in August and in September. And uh, I mentioned it before, but uh, here's the links to our CNC for you. We are doing a revamp. Um, so right now, uh, if you go on the site, we still have all of our previous webinars. This one won't be posted there until they make the new CNC for you live. Once that's live, you'll be able to see this one post as well. But make sure you always refer back to this um, if you want to utilize any of the older recordings. Um, and then moving forward, certainly for uh, looking to see what's coming next. Additionally, uh, I did mention this, I believe, last one, but uh, I wanted to point out the CNC training portion on our um, our website. So the direct link would be the usasiemens.com forward slash CNC training. But here we host a series of four different classes. They are hosted up in Elk Grove Village. That's just outside of Chicago and Illinois. Um, and they're three-day courses, very, 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 very comprehensive. Uh, we start, we have a service class, and then we have three levels of operation and programming, starting with our level one, which would be our shop mill, shop turn, conversational programming. Our level two is a G-code specific class covering turning and milling. Uh, we get into five, four axis turn uh, milling and uh, three axis turning, so traditional X and Z with some C axis live tooling support. Uh, that's, a, that's a great class to take a look at. And I do also host a five axis class there myself. That would be the level three class. Um, so any of these classes are fully available to all of our customers and end users and dealers and partners alike. Um, just go to this site. You can look at the agenda. And if you're interested in coming up and attending the course, just register for the course and you're more than welcome to come up. We'll even buy you lunch every day. So it's great, great, great resource um, by all means. If you can, I would definitely take advantage of it. So today, we'll be talking about specifically the 828 and the 840 controls. So I won't be differentiating between the two, because really all the functionality you're going to see today would apply in either of the two control platforms. So pretty much doesn't matter which one you're using or utilizing, any of the information today is going to apply for both of these control types. So you guys probably saw the description, but really the concept here is to kind of take a, a, a deeper dive into our CAN cycles, uh, what we call our standard cycles. So drilling, milling, you know, how do I do a pocket? What are all the unique uh, features and functions within the pocketing routine or our slotting routine? Um, wh what do we have 
Uh, what are our advanced capabilities when I go to just deep hole drilling and uh, decrementing my peck depths and stuff like that. So we're going to really kind of dig in to each of these cycles and apply them in a, in a real world example as we kind of go through. So what we'll do is we're first going to build this sample part, this sample part one, uh, traditional two and a half D kind of part, nothing all that complicated. So we're going to uh, face off the part you see in our ops list after we've faced it. We will put a simple circular pocket in the center of it. Um, once that's done, we're going to leave a six-sided boss standing with our multi-edge spigot function. Once we've done that, we're going to pass an open slot right through the center of it using our slotting cycles, and we get to see uh, some of our trichoidal milling strategies. Once we've done that, we're going to thread mill the inside of that big hole, which that hole happens to be a two-inch, uh, it'll end up being a two-inch thread on the inside of that hole. Um, then we're going to come back with the same part when we talk about our drilling and tapping routines, and we're going to do some center drilling. What's kind of unique here, we're going to get a chance to, to drill on multiple planes. So we'll be drilling down, uh, half inch down into the part as well as on the top of the part, and then we're going to go and put some tapped holes in it. So by the end, we should have a real good understanding of, of some of these cycles and features. And then time allotting, I've also uh, created a four-axis part that hopefully we'll get a chance to actually take everything we've kind of learned around over the course of building this part and apply it in a fourth axis scenario, because you'll find that there's some pretty unique features we have built into the system for four axis, um, for handling four axis uh, conversationally. Okay, so with that being said, we are gonna start with the milling cycle first. Uh, and I did decide to, I chose to, you know, select milling cycles prior to drilling. So this way we can have some features on the part. So like, you know, the potential collision of a, a drill and that boss and a few different other things, instead of just starting with drilling and just drilling on a flat surface. So we will start with milling first. So when I select the milling cycle and the milling button inside of our editor, this is what I'm going to see for my vertical soft keys. I'm going to get the face mill, pocket, multi-edge, slot, thread mill, engraving. That's all going to pop up on the side. And these are all the standard cycles we're now talking about. So we're going to get a chance to look at some of the specifics when I get to face milling and some of the things that uh, the face milling will do for me and some of the unique features. We are then going to explore pocketing, pocketing handle, circular, and rectangular. So we'll talk about each, and then we'll apply one specific feature. Then we're going to go into the multi-edge spigot cycle. Uh, there, there's a few different you know, ways we can apply that cycle, so we'll take a look at that. We do have a, a whole series of slotting routines built into the control, so we can look at that. And then after that, we're going to go and play around a little bit with our thread milling cycle and time allotting. We'll even do some engraving on the part. So the first one we start with, and generally when I normally start writing a program, this will probably be the first cycle I usually pick if I have to face off my part, and that would be our face mill cycle. So the face mill cycle, when I, when I select the face mill cycle and I open it up, this would be the graphic that I would expect to see and start filling out. And one of the first things you always want to kind of take a look at whenever you launch any of our cycles is the vertical soft keys. So looking on the screen, we have four vertical soft keys right along the side, and these are modifiers to the cycle. So this may be a different type of cycle. Um, for argument's sake, when we go into pocketing, this would be where I would go to select the difference between rectangular or circular. Uh, but in facing, this gives me the ability of modifying the cutter path. So a traditional facing cycle is going to make sure that it overlaps the cutter so it doesn't leave any edges or ridges, right? It's going to face off the whole part. Well, what if I have a clamp in the way? What if there's a vertical wall that I, I can't touch? Well, that's where these modifiers come in, too. So I just select one of or multiples of these, and you'll see, like in the graph to the upper right corner, it will now create a barrier and then keep me from overlapping it. So we'll kind of apply and play around with this a little bit. Um, then to the right here, we see just some of the common parameters. Um, there's not a lot here. We'll uh, definitely get a chance to talk about each of them as we apply the cycle. So what we're going to do is we're going to now take this and kind of apply it to a real-world scenario, starting to build up that part program that I mentioned. So what we'll do is we'll start a new program. We're certainly going to fill out a header page. Then from there, we're going to go to milling, select face mill, fill out the cycle with values specific to this part, and then we'll get a chance to run the graphics and see what's going to happen. So as typical, 
we are going to use our SinuTrain software. And SinuTrain will allow me to emulate, in this case, I built a four axis machine. So you can notice here in JOG, I got three linear axes, one rotary axis, and then my spindle, hence a four axis machine. So for us, we're going to go on in and create a new part program. So as long as you've seen some of my earlier series, you should be familiar with creating part programs. Simple as program manager, select new, and give it a name. So I'm going to call this one, we'll say, I'm going to put my caps locks on, sample one. Give it some name, right? Letters, numbers, and underscores. The only three characters we allow from our naming terminology. So we give it a name, we select OK, program gets launched just like we would normally see, and we start to fill out our header page. Now, one of the first things you might notice here that could be different than you guys are used to seeing is this clamping field. So this comes in specifically when we start to leverage four axis machining and capabilities. You also see this in five axis machines. So I can have the ability of orienting my, my graphics, my blank that I'm going to define next, in either position. So if you're on a traditional three axis machine, you're either not going to have this field at all, um, or if the, the builder commissioned it this way, uh, you're just going to leave it a table. Or if you happen to have a four axis machine and you're jumping between using it in three axis or four, you would differentiate it by this clamping type. Then from there would be our traditional, you know, pick what our blank or our block's going to look like. So if I take a look at my part print, we can bring it up here for everybody. We'll keep this one on top. I have a simple block, it's five by five. I'm not gonna worry about actually doing anything on the outside perimeter of the block. So I can, I can apply that to be my blank length and width, and I'm just gonna use block centered. This would be assigning the zero to be the middle of the part. Uh, it certainly could be a corner, but in that case, I would need to use my basic block function right there, and then I would define it a little differently. So we pick the block center, as we normally would, give it our length and width, how much material I'm leaving on the top, what's the overall thickness, in this case I have it set to absolute, all right? We're gonna define that we're in a standard G17 plane, that's normal. Retract, where do I wanna go when I'm done? We have a safety distance, so that's how close am I gonna to get to the part before I start feeding. We can toggle between climb mill and conventional mill. Climb milling is always going to be down cut. Conventional mill is always going to be up cut. And then we have our retraction. So initially I want to put this to optimized and then later down the road we're going to see um, how we might play, play around with this for different strategies. So that would be our standard header page. Let's save it up. And now we're going to go and we're going to explore the milling routine. So if I select the milling button, this is going to get us into all the standard milling cycles. So here we start to see that list of cycles that I talked about just earlier when we presented it, and we are looking at the face milling specifically. So face milling, this is going to be our traditional face mill cutter path. Now, remember I said when you first come in, always pay attention to the right side? Well, this is that modifier. So for argument's sake, if I knew that, hey, on my left side, I can't go beyond this, well, it'll make sure that the cutter doesn't move beyond that edge, and the edge being two and a half inches over, right, because zero is center of my part. I have the ability of maybe gating two sides. I can gate multiple sides. Now, if I start to pick a strategy that doesn't work, we're going to tell you that that strategy won't work. In this case, I'm telling the machine to go in a Y direction, Y with an X step over. Well, certainly, I, how do I lead on to the part if I have a wall there? So that's what this is telling me. So here, it may be a case where I need to pick an X machining direction with a Y step over because I have three gates. So, you know, you'll apply these different limiters as you go. Um, if you don't need them, you just leave them off. So then from there, our cycles always work the same basic way. So you want to kind of start from the top down, treat every field as a question, and start building a cycle. So the first question is, what tool am I using? So for for time's sake, and I know I've spent a lot of time talking about tooling in the past webinars, I'm not going to go through all the details, but I've pre-created a bunch of tools for us. And for our sake, we are going to use a face mill. Now, one of the things, this tool certainly could have been built as an end mill instead of a face mill, but one of the unique features that a face mill gives to us when I build a tool as a face mill is the further data function. And what this allows me to do is it allows me to do or define a true diameter of the cutter 
and a cutter angle. So if I have a face mill where my inserts raked at a 45 degree angle, which is very typical for a face mill, the system can know that and compensate for it. So now when I gave it that, that barrier, that edge wall, it's using this true outside diameter so it knows how far off it has to stay away from that wall to keep it from colliding. So that's why it's important, especially if I'm creating a routine where I have limiters, that I define the tool properly. So we select the face tool, tell it to program as we normally would, fills out the face tool. Now we notice that D1 gets selected. Well, in that case, we had only one cutting edge built for this tool. That's why it defined the number one. If I had picked a tool that had a second or a third cutting edge selected and I was highlighting that, that would be when it would force that field to get written. Once we've selected tool, the next strategy is defining what our feed rate's gonna be. And this is gonna be the same definition as we go in and out of each of these cycles. So we have, in milling, we have two different options. I can do feed per tooth, or I can just do our traditional inches per minute. So feed per tooth is certainly going to look at the cutter and specifically how many flutes or how many cutting edges I told it this cutter had. That's how it'll do its calculation for the feed rate. As well, we have our surface footage or straight RPM. So if I'm using surface footage, it's going to use the diameter of the tool. It's going to do its calculations just like you normally would. Keeps your mind to do the calc for you. All right, so I pick my two feed and speed strategies. Now the next question is, what am I doing with this tool? Am I roughing? That would be a single diamond. Or in this case, am I finishing? That would be a triple diamond. So just the nature of picking roughing or finishing is going to change how this cycle responds. One, you'll notice that the step down, the DZ field, goes away if I pick finishing. And two, you notice that it's now applying a slightly different strategy. It's forcing the cutter to come all the way off the surface, allowing it to wrap it to the next position, and then feeding across again. So in a finishing strategy, we're trying to keep you from getting those, those witness marks, right? Those lines of the tool changing direction. If you're roughing, we figure you're probably gonna come back or you're not that worried about finish quality. So here, we're trying to give you the best optimized cutter path for time. Next question down the list would certainly be my cutter direction options. We talked about this briefly when we were talking about the modifiers, but here I can decide, am I doing a zigzag or a bi-directional cut in my X? Am I doing that same cut in my Y? Or am I doing a unidirectional in my X or a unidirectional in my Y? So I can choose either strategy. So we're doing a bi-directional, I'll just do it in my, my X. Now this is one of the few cycles, in fact, it's the only cycle that uses the blank that we just filled out in our header page to feed this cycle. And this is definitely a unique feature to shop mill specifically. You're not gonna see this kind of uh, response in program guide. But what the system did is said, hey, I know I got a five by five block. Uh, happen to know the zeros center of the blart. So I'm going to automatically pick the lower left corner and set that as my negative two and a half by two and a half. It did feed over the rough stock value that I gave it of 25 thou. And it automatically found the opposing corner by applying a incremental length and an incremental uh, height. So it found the two corners. If my shape was slightly different than my blank, I can certainly override these values. It only ever puts these in the first time the cycle gets built. So if I overwrite them, it's not gonna rewrite them after the fact. Now what it doesn't know that I would need to make sure I tell it is where is my ending position. So in this case, I'm gonna end at Z0, which would be the top of my part. Next, I have to tell it how the cycle is going to step over. So there's two ways within our control to, to find a step over. I can do a physical linear distance, which is what you would commonly see in most control systems. And then I would have to kind of think about my cutter diameter tell, and how much I would want to step over. Or I can do a percentage of the cutter diameter. And then once I pick percentage, obviously if I change tools midstream, it'll automatically optimize the program to maintain the same percentage step over. DZ is always going to signify my depth per cut, just like my DXY would be my, my step over, my engagement there. DZ is the same thing with my step down. So since I'm in a roughing strategy, I'm telling the system I'm probably going to take more than one cut. That's why you have the DZ field. And then here, I'm physically going in and defining how much I want. So these values don't have to stack up. You know, I'm leaving 25,000 material. If I leave, if I tell it to take a cut of 20,000, 
it's going to just take a final cut at the end of zero or of uh, five thou, shall I say. So you can kind of work in your own little finish passes by playing with, with these values. You don't have to make sure that they all add up to the total depth. It's never going to overcut what's being controlled by Z0 and Z1. And then my final question will be if I wanted to leave any material for a finished pass. Now, it will not take this material. I would need to go back with the finish cycle after this to then take that final material off. So we fill out the page, we hit accept. Once I hit accept, I can now go and simulate it and we should start to see our part get built a little bit. So we'll go into maybe a 3D view. I can uh, zoom in a little bit for you guys and we'll rerun it. The cutter comes down, it's cutting and you can start to see there's that angle of the tool it now knows from the tool table. So if I had, told it that there was a solid wall here, it would have made sure that the body was shifted over by that amount. Okay, so we're starting to build our program. Now let's continue on in our operations list. So the next operation and the next cycle we're gonna to start to look at would be the pocketing cycle. So pocketing, there's two potential um, strategies or two potential operations within pocketing rectangular and circular. So we're gonna specifically write the program for circular, but we will take a quick look at rectangular and just show you a few of the features here, and then let's apply the circular. Um, so what you're seeing now, obviously, is what the graphic would look like when I went into each of these screens and I picked one of the two vertical soft keys once I pick pocket, and that's gonna drive me into rectangular or circular. And then we'll have a lot of, a lot of typical questions like you just saw in the phasing cycle would be phrased for this specific type of cutter path. Okay, so from there, this is why we're gonna kind of apply the cycle. So we're gonna go back to milling, select pocket now, and we gotta make sure we remember to pick circular pocket next. Once we've picked circular pocket, we'll go through, fill out the different strategies within this pocketing cycle, then we'll get a chance to apply it, and we should now see a circular pocket come in underneath the face milling cycle we just created. So we jump back to CineTrain here. We go over to milling, and now I'm gonna go and select the pocketing cycle. So you always wanna make sure you pick the cycle you want first. Because what happens is, you know, let's say I start filling out the page and I say, okay, well, I'm gonna want my um, I don't know, my inch and a quarter cutter, and this is gonna be my feed rate of, of you know, whatever I wanna do, uh, 15 inches a minute, let's say. And then all of a sudden I say, oops, you know what, I really wanted a circular pocket. Well, it's not gonna transfer these variables to the circular pocket field. So I'm gonna to have to go and then refill out the page when I get over to circular pocket. So it's the best habit always entering any cycle, take a look at the right side modifiers and pick the one you appropriate one you want before you get started and you get halfway down the page and realize, oh, I gotta start over again with that given cycle. So I pick my, my either of my options. So right now I just wanna take a look at the pocketing cycle just to do a quick overview of it. Um, certainly some of the unique features here, I can control where my reference position is in the pocket. So when I'm telling it where my, where my pocket is in relation to part zero, um, I, can, I can base this based on some of the geometry I happen to know off my print. So a lot of times you'll see most pocketing cycles, it's, it's everything's working from the center, let's say, and that's all you can ever do. So you have to do some math to figure out if the, if the, the drawing was you know, dimensioned from the lower left corner, let's say. Well, in this case, I have the ability of picking which corner my reference point, that's my X0, Y0, are gonna be coming from. You're gonna see that we're gonna get some roughing strategies. Now, once we get to pocketing, we get a few extra scenarios that we can do. We don't get just the roughing or the finishing, but I can do finishing on a wall only, or I can do chamfers. So here I can come in and do a chamfer around the, the part. So there's a few extra features and functions when you start to apply like chamfers. We tell it what the chamfer size is and then our insertion to make sure the tip is a little bit below that edge so I don't roll a burr. If I was picking something like my wall, now the system's going to drop down and just machine on the wall of the part. Then from there, 
Um, if you go down through, you'll find everything else is pretty self-explanatory. You know, it's where in this case is the corner or the center of my zero zero. What's the top of the part? What's the width? What's the length of this pocket? You know, if I have a corner radius. So very similar parameters to like you just saw in the facing cycle. Now, when rectangular pocketing, I have three different strategies for getting the tool engaged into the part. I can do what's called vertical, which would just be a plunge to depth and then begin to machine. So in this case, I need a center cutting end mill or I'd have to have a pre-drilled hole. I can do a small helical cutter path to lead in to my first depth of cut, or I can do a taper. This would be a linear move feeding into the part again. As long as I have a shallow enough infeed, then I could get away with a non-setter cutting tool. But I would control that with this angle value. Now, when we jump over to circular, which we're going to apply for the part print now, if we take a look at our print, we'll bring it back up here for you guys, I need to put some kind of a pocket. Now, in this case, we'll, uh, we'll be putting in a 1.9 inch diameter hole. That'll be the minor diameter of this 2 inch 8 thread we're going to thread mill, let's say. So, like we did before, we want to go select an appropriate tool. So, I'm going to I'm going to pick the three quarter inch end mill. That should be uh, adequate for milling this pocket. We're going to give it a feed rate and a spindle speed. And just like you saw before, I can hit my select key, my little horseshoe on my, my keyboard here. And there I can pick whether I want to have inches per minute or feed per tooth. Same thing with the RPM. Here I have the same strategies I saw before on the rectangular pocket. So I can come in and do a circular pocket. So we're going to rough it out first. And now we have, and this is unique to the circular pocket, we have two different strategies for clearing the material. I can do what we call centric, which would be like a traditional plane by plane clearing. The system's going to feed to its first depth, clear all the material, feed the next depth, clear all the material. Or I can do what we call a helical, which uh, some other controls or some other CAM systems may refer to this as like turbo milling. The system's going to do a three axis helix, all the way to the bottom. Then it's going to pull out. If it couldn't cover all the material in one shot, it'll then move over by whatever my step over amount is and do another helix all the way down to the bottom. And then it'll keep repeating that until it gets all the way out to, in this case, out to 1.9 diameter. So that, for me, is my preferable method for using circular pockets. It gives you much better chip evacuation. You can run certainly higher feeds and speeds in this scenario. Now, in any of our milling cycle, whenever you see the option single position, we do have the ability of picking a position pattern. So this is going to work just like the drilling cycles when we get there. And it gives me the ability of, hey, if I needed 10 pockets, I wouldn't have to program 10 pockets. I could program one and then give it the center of each pocket 10 times over, and it would machine that pocket 10 times over. So that's where the pattern comes in. We're just doing a single, and the single happens to be at 0, 0, center of my part top is zero. I'm going to give it the, the total diameter of the inside of the pocket. I'm going to give it the depth of it. And then we'll tell it what our radial engagement or our step over is going to be. I'm doing 50% of my end mill, or I could do a linear, linear amount if I hit the select key. Now the P is new for you, and that has to do with this helix scenario. So this would be like the pitch of a thread. So how aggressively do I want this uh, to advance every 360 degrees of this tool. So in my scenario, one full revolution of that cutter all the way around the, the part shape is going gonna, is gonna to move in or advance by an eighth of an inch. Do I want to leave material for a finished cut? If I'm not, just set it to zero. If you leave the material here, you will have to go back with a different cycle to take it. Same thing if I wanted to leave material at the bottom. Now this is unique, and you see this both in rectangular and circular pocket. We have a function or an option called remachining. Now what remachining allows me to do is if I had already maybe ran a, a one-inch drill through the center of this, uh, or a previous op had taken out a lot of this material already for me, I don't have to keep machining over top of that. So I tell it, in this case, a depth and a diameter, and then from there, it'll just machine where it has to machine the outside. And you had the same feature well, back in the rectangular pocket, the difference is the center remachining you'd be describing as some kind of a rectangular or square, so you'd have a width and a length. 
works the same way. It keeps you from just wasting a lot of dead time. You find a lot of canned cycles traditionally you wanted to always start from the middle and clear everything because you're telling me this is a clearing cycle. And that's where this remachining comes into very handy. Uh, in our case, we want to do a complete machine. So we save it, we go to simulate, faces it off, and then you see the cutter is doing the helical cutter path all the way down until it gets all the way out to the 1.9 diameter. And there we are. So if I was to, to look in this a little bit, we'll zoom in for you. This right here, this is your helix, this is your spiral. And the distance between each of these lines would be that T variable. In this case, it would be an eighth of an inch. All right. So from there, the next operation that we're going to work on is going to be our spigot cycle. Uh, and a lot of times, we in the U.S. like to think of this as a boss. So same concept, same type of cycle. We're leaving something standing. So that would be our, our physical spigot cycle. And a spigot cycle has three possible scenarios. It has a rectangle, it has a circle, or it has what we call the multi-edge spigot. So in this case, we're going to use the multi-edge spigot. Now, there's something unique that the multi-edge spigot gives us that the rest of the spigots don't do. So the standard rectangular circular spigot is only ever going to walk around the part it's never going to step up in X and Y. It'll allow you to do multiple depth cuts in the Z, but if you look down the list, there's no DXY variable, and DXY is our step over. So although you may be defining rough length, rough width in the rectangle or a starting diameter in the circle, we're only using that to control the lead in and lead out of the tool to make sure that the tool is off the part when it ramps in. When you get to the multi-edge, this one has a DXY field, and the DXY field allows me to do a clearing step over. So sometimes I'll use the, the multi-edge in a scenario where I know I need to clear up and leave something standing, and maybe it's not six-sided. Maybe it's really just a square, so I can tell that it's got four sides. Or maybe it's an actual round. Well, I can tell that it's got four sides, but the radius is Half the, you know, half the value of the side, automatically giving me a full round part. So you can kind of fool around and play with these cycles a little bit to accommodate what you're doing. Um, certainly the limitation about the multi-edge is the part or the feature is always going to be symmetrical. So I couldn't do a rectangular shape. I could do a square, but we don't have the ability of defining a different length to a different width. So that would be one of the drawbacks in trying to apply it there. Um, but if you get a case where you do need to leave something standing and you can't just get it all in one shot around it for the X and Y, nobody says you can't just save a couple of these a, a couple of these events in a row and just keep moving in the final dimensions a little bit each time till you get to the size you want. That is certainly a feasible scenario. So in our example, we're going to go back to milling, select our multi-edge spigot, and now I'm going to pick multi-edge define the cycle. Once the cycle is fully defined, we'll get a chance to see it and we'll start to see how it can clear up, leaving the boss standing. In this case, it's going to be a six-sided six -sided feature. So within sinew train, we'll bring up sinew train, bring up the print so we have some dimensions. So if I look at the part features, one of the things that it's told to me is the flat, the actual flat to the intersection of these two lines would be two inches. It's critical for the spigot cycle that I need to know. Um, I do know the corner radius here is 250. That's critical. And I'm going to need to know the overall depth of what I'm doing. So in this case, I'm going down to a half inch depth in total. That'll work. So now I want to make sure my highlight's here on circular pocket because the system always inserts below wherever my highlight is. We go back to milling. We select multi-edge. I have my three options. Remember, always pick them first, so I get the rectangular. So rectangular, I can define a rough length and rough width. That's where it starts to control that lead in from. And then I just give it my final length and width, and then it would leave this as a standing boss. And you can take this in multiple depths and cut. You don't have to take it all in one shot, so you have a DZ value, right? Circulars works the same way. The only difference is I give it a starting diameter and an ending diameter. Again, it's just going to lead in that way, but I can take multiple depths and cut here. 
Or for our example, we use multi-edge, and now we're going to come in and walk around the shape and do our multi-edge. So we're going to select a tool. I'm going to use a, a big tool for this one. So I'm grabbing an inch and a quarter end mill I happen to have created. We're going to come down. Maybe I want to run, I don't know, we'll do 20 inches a minute, uh, 2,500 RPM, we'll say. Now I have some options. So it's going to be the same as we talked about earlier. I can rough. I can finish. I can finish just on the wall if I wanted to. Or I can put a chamfer on. So let's say I want to just come in, do a roughing cycle, clear all the material. You can link this to a pattern if you wanted to. We don't need to, so we're going to do a single position. What's the center of my feature? So in this case, it's going to be 0, 0, center of my part. What's the top of the feature? In this case, it's Z0. What is a starting diameter? So this uses a circle to start as its uh, outside roughing shape. So in my case, I just kind of made my diameter big enough, knowing that I make it a little bit of lost motion off the part, but as it loops in, it's going to clear. If you know, if you're kind of fooling around with this and you're not so sure, so let's say I, I for argument's sake, left this only at four inches instead of my uh, five and a half, you'll see it'll just leave some material standing, and then I can go back and make a quick edit. Now here's my number of sides. So if I was going to try to fool this and maybe tell it it's a square or, or round, I could change this to four sides. In our case, we have six sides, so I'm going to tell it six. The length of a side in, in this scenario is two inches, so we can give it. It's not tipped at any angle, so I'm going to time it at zero. We have a corner radius. In this scenario, it's 250 according to our print, so we'll put it. The overall depth was half inch, and this can be either absolute or incremental. It will be the same value in this sake, but I always like to change or set everything to absolute whenever I can. We have a step over. We're going to take a 50% cutter step over like we did before. Uh, multi steps down, so maybe I'm going to take this in two, and do I want to leave material for a finished cut? So why don't we leave a little bit of material for a finished cut? So let's say I left. 20 thou, and then we can come in with just one final finish to kind of clear out. There's something critical I want to talk about with this finishing scenario. And then I have my UZ. I'm going to let it bring it right to size and the depth. So we fill out the page. We hit accept. Now let's go simulate it. And we should start to get the shape we're expecting. So we come across, pocket out the part. One more pass in the pocket, and then you're going to start to see that we're going to have this inch and a quarter tool start to work out. So now in this case, you see how I'm leaving a little material in the corners? That was because I moved that starting diameter in a little bit. I set it at four. So here you can kind of just play around with this a little bit until you get to enough of a value that it doesn't leave anything in the corners, and I'm not taking maybe too heavy a cut either, you know, so I can start moving this out. Now, what I just did to speed up my simulation real quick is I hit the, the key control and then M. So you see right here where it shows you the speed of simulation, in this case 100%. Well, if you do control M, it jumps it up to max, and the system's going to just try to execute as much as it can. Um, what If you flip it back from control M and just hit control M again, puts it right back to 100%. So as the programs get longer, it's nice to do that to kind of speed up. So I don't have the ability in simulation to uh, skip over operations. It's always going to want to start from the beginning. So little tricks like that will kind of speed up your prove out process. So here we have the part. Remember, we left a little material. I am getting a little witness line here of where my cut steps were, which would be what I expect to see on the part. So we want to come back and take a finished cut, right? So we come back in. We go over to multi-edge spigot, right? We pick the multi-edge spigot. Now, the system will automatically retain the last settings. So if I want to take the same tool and come back for a finish, I just have to come back and tell it what I want to finish. Now, in this case, I already machined it right to half inch, so I don't need to finish the floor at all. But I do want to finish the wall. So all the variables that you just filled out are still here. We just take a few away. So you don't have to learn anything new. Um, you just have to really just apply what's there. The only difference, and what people are inclined to want to do all the time, is change this finish amount to a value of zero. The problem is when you set it to zero, the system immediately says, oh, no, I'm sorry, you can't save this event because the finish allowance at the wall is too small. 
So this is where it gets a little goofy. Um, what we do is we use the UXY in a finishing strategy to calculate our lead-in to make sure that when I bring the cutter down, it doesn't clip any material. So we expect you to leave this at the value you had. It will automatically bring the system to the final dimensions of the part. It's not leaving the finish at this point in time. So like just to show you, you know, if I put some giant value in here, a half inch, you would expect when it comes to the finish, like it wouldn't be anywhere near the part. But what you'll see is it just gives it a little bigger ramp or lead in. So you can actually control your lead in and the lead out here. But generally, standard rule of thumb would be just to leave the UXY to whatever you had set in the roughing, which would be how much material you left on the wall. So this way, when it finishes it, it makes sure it can ramp on without clipping the part. Um, and actually, I am going to go in, and we're going to just change our depth per pass. We're going to take it all in one shot. So with the depth per pass, if I want to take it in one cut, all I have to do is make sure my depth of pass is equal to or greater than my total depth. And it's an unsigned value. That's why I have a positive value here. We save it. We simulate it. Rough, rough, rough. We'll let it slow down so we can, we can certainly see the cutter path. Now, one of the tricks I like to use under the show path is the delete path function. So you'll find things get a little muddy. And I don't want to just take the path off. I just want to clear up what's there. That's where the delete path comes in. So there you see that was the final path. Center line is basically right on the other path. It's actually just on the inside of it. So if it had been using a half inch, I would be all the way out here. And you can even kind of see your, your ramp in and your ramp out used. So that's where that, uh, that finish amount comes into play. OK, so we've machined down the part. We are now at the stage. I think we're putting the slot in next, but let's uh, jump back over to our PowerPoint here. And yes, so now we're going to look at the slotting cycles. So here, there's, th there's three unique slotting cycles that you can utilize within the system. There's the longitudinal slotting cycle, and this would be what we call a, uh, a captured key or a captured slot. So here you would be most commonly or similar to a rectangular pocket, but you have a full radius at either end. And it gives you just a little better cutter strategy than trying to use a pocketing cycle for a keyway. Then from there, we have circumferential slots. And that would be a slot that is about a radius. So very similar to like a bolt hole pattern. Now you don't have to have multiple slots. You can just do one. Uh, but you have the ability, if you wanted to or needed to do multiple slots without a radius, you could do that as well. So a lot of times I find on features, more commonly, I might just have one of these slots because maybe this is like a, uh, a cam action or it's a, an adjustment where I'm limiting how much something can, can move on either end. Uh, typically, that's only a single slot. So you would just set the end value to one. And we'll look at this cycle briefly. And then for us, we're going to use this open slot. So in an open slot strategy, it knows that it's going to start from off the part, feed all the way through, whatever my, my machining strategy is, and poke back out the other side. That would be our open slot scenario. So in our case, we're going to come in. We're going to use an open slot. Now, we are going to do it in two, two cycles, two events, because you see here. We're going to use our roughing. And then we're going to use what they call semi-finishing. This is unique to the open slot routine. Um, and you'll see. I'm going to get the spiral cutter path if I use the trachoidal option. That would naturally give us some wave to the part. So the semi-fin just allows it to just take a light cut along both sides, taking out any de deviation, and just cleaning up the surface without maybe working in a true finish pass. So we're going to, we're going to do that here in our next example. So we're back into our program. We've created the multi-edge. We can bring the part print up. We have a slot that, according to my print, is 3 quarters inch wide. And it's all the way through this spigot or hex feature. So when you go over to milling, we're going to go into the slotting function now. And in slotting, I have my three routines. So my encapsulated slot, my slot, 
my circumferential slot, slot about a radius. So this would be where I could pick if I wanted one or not. And it's a pretty straightforward cycle once you see it. Um, the big thing here is just controlling the start and end is controlled with this alpha zero, alpha one field. So alpha zero would be the start of the slot to the center of the radius of the slot. And then my included angle to the end of the slot. So that's about the only thing I have to figure out when I'm trying to time where this slot would be on my part. But typically, well, everything we're going to see in the open slot would be the same variables. So the big difference in open slot is this is going to um, basically be able to blow right through, understanding that it's going to be able to come off the other side of the part. So we pick a tool. I'm just going to use a uh, half-inch end mill. Now, one of the limitations to this slotting cycle when using the trichoidal function is I have to make sure that the cutter diameter is um, greater than or equal to half the width of the slot. So if my cutter starts to become less than half the width, so in this case, um, I got a 750 slot, I need to have at least a 3 8 cutter diameter, and once I start to go below that, it's going to tell me I can't do it because it understands it's leaving too much material during its scallop. Um, so instead of trying to incorporate some kind of straight moves, which you'd see maybe a cam system would automatically compensate for, this is doing a true spiral the whole way. Uh, so because of that, you got to make sure that the tool is at least uh, half the width of the slot. In this case, I'm, I'm a half inch tool, so I'm a little greater. I should be fine. So pick your tool. Certainly give it some feeds and speeds that would be appropriate to the material. This is the same scenario. Now, how am I just showing or, or dimensioning where the slot is? So if I was going to do this maybe in two separate slots, um, I could tell it, hey, you know, my slot one is the center of this feature, slot two is the center of that. Uh, for time's sake, I'm just going to blow straight through the part. So we're just going to do one slot working from the middle. In our case, the middle is going to be zero, zero. Now, when you get to the machining strategies, we have the same strategies we've been seeing, but we have this new one, this semi-fin. So the semi-finish is just going to roll right around the geometry. If I was leaving material for a finish pass, it wouldn't take that off. Um, I would have to do a finish for that. It's just cleaning up what potentially the spiral could have left in these corners. So in our case, we're going to rough it out. We're going to use one of two different strategies. So I have spiral milling, which the industry would be referring to this as trichoidal milling, or I have plunge cutting. So here we'd be doing some straight paths, plunging through the shape. So we're going to do the spiral, cutter path. Within spiral, I have three different strategies. I can do a down cut or a climb milling routine. Right? So if you watch the shape of the arrow, and I think of the rotation of my spindle, this would be a traditional climb milling routine. I can do an up cut, which would be conventional milling, depending on my material. Sometimes it would run better that way, or if I have a real loose machine. And then my final would be a scalloped cut. So it's going to be down cut, up cut, down cut, up cut, making its way through. And depending on these strategies, it may depend on whether that rule about the tool is, a, is an issue or not. So it is, a typical, it is an issue when you are doing true trichoidal style spiral cutter path. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a down cut strategy. We're just going to do the one so we don't have multiples. The center of this feature is 0, 0. Top is 0. We happen to have a width of 3 quarter, according to my print. Now, the length I didn't necessarily know, but I just kind of guessed. And then I can see in my graphics if I'm wasting a lot of time or not. I could tip the whole slot on an angle. In this case, mine's aligned to 0, so I'm going to leave it at 0. The depth, what my radial engagement is, just like before with my, my end mill, this is how much the spiral is going to loop in by depth for pass. You know, so in this case, I could do more, like more of a true trichoidal cutter path where I can do a lighter radial engagement. So I'm doing, in my scenario, 30% engagement. And it's only a quarter inch deep, so I'm taking all one depth. And I'm not worried about a finish cut. I'm going to bring it right to size, but I am going to use that semi-finishing routine just to clean up. So I build the cycle. I hit accept. Now I can immediately go right back to my slotting cycle again. It retained all the info for me. So all I have to do is just pick the semi-fin. You see that my 
step over goes away. So now this is going to give me a straight linear path around the shape. I hit accept. Now if we simulate it, we can start to get our slot, our spiral. So we'll speed up a little bit, and there would be our spiral through. And here we're walking around the shape. Okay, so once I get the slot in, now it's a matter of going and finishing up my threading, my thread mill, and that'll finish up the milling segment of this, this webinar, this seminar. So what we want to do is we're going to talk about two different things. We're going to talk about the thread milling first, and then we'll touch briefly upon the engraving cycle, and then we'll go apply a thread. So a thread milling cycle, just to talk about its functions and features, it can certainly support both ID or OD, right? There's an internal or an external field here. I can rough or finish with the cycle. What's neat is I can control if I want to thread mill from the top down or down up. There's a feature where we'll tell it the number of flutes on the tool, so it'll figure out how much you can take per shot. Now, but one of the only things we don't support here in the thread mill cycle is a taper angle. And we don't support that because really this cycle was written around true thread mill cutters. And if you're going to do like a pipe taper or any type of tapered thread mill, what we would expect you would be doing would be using a tool that already has that angle ground into it. Um, so for our case, in our control, if you did need to do a like a single point cutter, creating a spiral that's getting smaller and smaller with the taper, that would have to be done in external uh, commands. So um, the system can certainly do it. We just don't have that accommodated for in the can cycle. But other than that, you're going to then just tell it, you know, ODID, what are the basic parameters? Now, what I do want to point out, and this always kind of throws guys for a little bit of a loop when you get into thread milling, is the feed rate at which it cuts. So this feed value right up here, oops, let me, uh, let me go back. This feed value at the top, that would be the feed for a linear move. Well, if we think about a thread mill, it's never doing a linear move. It's always doing a circular cutter path. So... What you have here is this little formula down at the bottom. This actually comes directly out of any number of thread mill manufacturers will give you this number because they know that the feed rate that's being calculated for different materials and geometries of cutters, that feed rate's a linear value. But to truly take the tool and apply it properly on a given part, you have to calculate what the true feed rate would need to be at the center of the tool. Typical CNCs can't maintain the feed rate at the cutter edge. Our system does this all automatically for you. So what's going to end up happening is you're going to program 30 inches a minute, and then you're going to run an internal, let's say. Now the inside, if you look at the, the distance that the center of the cutter would have to go around in relation to the outside, it's a lot smaller. Right? So what we'll do is we'll automatically slow down the feed to maintain 30 inches a minute at the cutter edge. Or on an outside part, we'll increase the feed to maintain 30 inches a minute at the cutter edge. So for any of us that's curious what the formula is, and if you use this formula based on your parameters, you'll notice that the feed rate it's running at 100% is this feed. This is the physical formula. So the way it works is F2 is the actual feed. So if I was wanting to run 30 inches a minute, let's say, it's going to be times the diameter of the workpiece. So in my case, it would be 2 inch, let's say, is the major diameter of the thread, minus the cutter diameter divided by the diameter of the workpiece again. So you would do this portion of the formula first, multiply that by the feed rate, the linear feed, and that's going to give me the feed that I would actually be doing at the center of the, the center of the tool. Inversely, for an external, it's going to be the diameter plus the diameter of the cutter, then, di then divided by that diameter. Multiply that by the feed, and that will give you the new calculated feed for the outside center of the cutter. So, again, the system will do this automatically for you, but this is the actual formula it's using to maintain the proper chip load at the edge of the cutter. From there, we do also have an engraving cycle. This part, we don't have any engraving. If time allows, hoping, we're getting a little tight on time here, but hoping we can uh, look at the engraving cycle a little bit. So in our case, why don't we continue moving on? Now, this cycle is going to be the first cycle that we're going to need a little additional information on. So when thread milling, it does require you to give it a location for where you want to thread mill, and potentially multiple locations, because this is very similar to like a drilling cycle would. So in this case, you're going to get to see the position pattern screen. 
So we have uh, milling, thread mill, define the thread mill, give it our locations, and then we go in and physically cut the part. So we're going to define that right now. So if we go back to sinew train, go back into our part program, right? Let's uh, bring our print up just so we can see it here. We have to put in a two inch eight thread the center of this part. So under milling, under thread mill, I now come in and we're going to fill out the page. So first thing first, I did pre-create a cutter. It's not much when you come to creating a thread mill cutter. It is under the cutter section, so the, where all the other end mills are. Um, and the only thing I really have to tell it is the, uh, the diameter and the number of flutes if I was programming some type of feed per tooth scenario. Um, this isn't the number of teeth on the cutter. That'll get compensated for in the cycle. Give it your feed rates, and again, linear or fever tooth, just hit the select key. Same thing with RPM or surface footage. We can do roughing or finishing. I'm going to rough it out. This is where I control whether I'm moving from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. So I'm going to work from the, the top to the bottom in this case. I can pick if it's a right hand or a left hand thread. Is it an internal or an external thread? It's all handled right here. Now the NT, this is the number of teeth. So this is important because the system will try to utilize as much of this cutter as it can. So if you wanted it to do a full spiral generating the whole thing just off this leading instead of dropping to the bottom, you would have to put your NT at one. But in this case, if I put it at five or six or whatever, it'll make sure it can create, in this case, up to five thread leads in one revolution of the cutter. Total depth at the bottom. Now you notice I'm not ever telling it Z0 where to start from anywhere here, and I'm also not telling it where the center is because that's handled in the position screen. We have a table for picking the thread type, or if it's a non-standard like this, I can come down, I can select pitch, threads per inch, uh, module thread, or a metric thread. So um, I'm just going to leave it at threads per inch. Um, my print says eight. You can do math right in any of these fields, so I could do you know, one divided by eight, or I could hit the equal sign to get a calculator to pop up. In this case, I have the value there, so we're good. What is the true major diameter? So this would be larger in this case than the hole size. The hole was machined to the minor of the thread. What is the thread height? I'm just taking 50 thou. If I really wanted to calculate it out, I think uh, eight pitches are at 80 thou, but 50 is fine for our sake. Luckily, we don't have a go gauge. Then I'm going to tell it how much I want to take for cut. So remember, this is, this is roughing. So it'll take one pass and then move out and do another pass to kind of rough into this part. I can leave material for a finished cut if I needed to. And I can also clock my thread. So if the start of that thread was critical in relation to some feature on the part, you can control that. So you fill out the page, hit accept. Now, in this case, this is going to look very similar to the, the drilling cycles. You get this little open-ended bracket. So if I was trying to simulate right now, it would tell me that there's something missing. It doesn't have enough information. I need to tell it where it's drilling. So we are simply going to go over to the drilling cycle. We can go into the position screen. And now I can pick one of my position strategies. In this case, I'm doing a random. Tell it the top of the part. Could be zero, and in this case, zero, zero. And that'll allow me to say, hey, thread mill at zero, zero, starting from a Z position to zero. So now, as we start to do it, you're going to see we have a completed milling part. So we'll just start to speed up a little bit. And there's your thread mill coming in, thread milling the part. You don't get, uh, you don't get teeth in any of our tapping or milling just from the graphics, so it's not too heavy. But if I was to, uh, let's run this again. I just want to show you, we're going to kind of clean it up here a little bit. I went too far, wasn't quick enough on my control M. All right, so there's your trichoidal milling going through. I just wanted to clean up my path a little bit. There's your finish in the trichoidal. So the system will do actually only two leads and then step in again. So this is because I have those five teeth described, right? It drops down, and then it's just doing a helix down, drops down the next one, does a helix. If I was doing from the bottom up, it would do the inverse. But be careful with the bottom up. I got to make sure I have enough clearance on the shank of that tool. You know, here, once it's machining, it's okay, but I 
could be a little tight. Generally, you would, you would expect to have enough clearance. Though. Okay. So our part is milled. Now we got some holes. Uh, I did get a question that came up. Can we explain the thread section in the P field of the thread milling cycle? Let's go back to that. So this would be the pitch. Okay. So, so what's happening here is this is the physical value of the actual thread. So I am cutting a two inch eight thread. The eight is threads per inch. So I can tell threads per inch by toggling to the threads per inch field, or I could do the math. So the math, if you're ever trying to figure out what the pitch of a thread is, so the pitch of a thread is the distance from either the root of one lead to the root of the next, or the, the, the crest of one to the crest of the next, that's the, the physical pitch of the thread. So in this case, if I wanted to manually calculate it, the, the pitch is always one divided by the number of the number of threads over one inch, over a factor of one inch. In this case, 0.125. So hopefully that was clear enough for that field. And thank you for the question. Okay, so now we're going to jump over and we got to go talk about drilling a little bit. So if we segue back over to our PowerPoint, we're now going to talk about utilizing the drilling cycles. And there's a whole host of cycles we need to go through. So basically what I'll see when I hit the drilling button is our centering, drilling, depot drilling. We've got a boring cycle, threading, and then we have our tapping, which is under our threading cycle, and then our positions. And you started to see the positions a little bit here. So in this example, we're going to get an opportunity to center drill, drill, and depot drill. Um, we're not going to do the boring routine, but we can take a peek at it as we're going through. Um, what's cool with the boring, this would be if I use a, a traditional boring bar or a boring head. The system has the ability of orienting the tool at the bottom of the hole and pulling off the wall before it retracts. So some good features there. Um, and certainly we're going to try to do some, some tapping here on our part. Okay. So in this case, the first thing I want to do is center drill. And what's going to be unique about this part is going to be center drilling on multiple planes. Now, one of the one of the the the, the, the nicer features that I like about our center drilling cycle that's pretty unique. I don't know if I've ever seen it in another can cycle. Is that I have the ability of programming. Oops, sorry, a physical diameter that I'm going to open up the spot. I can do either the a tip depth or a diameter I'm opening up to. Now, this is dependent on how I build the tool. So I've got to make sure I have the proper angle there, but the system will calculate how far in it has to move the Z to give me a chamfer size of, in this case, 3.25, which was called out on my print. So it's very, very handy instead of having to do the math all the time. Once we've done that, we are going to go into the positions routine because we're going to have to create some positions. Now, the position cycle or routine allows us to accommodate random holes, Arrays of holes, and the holes can be linear or in a frame. Bolt hole patterns. And there is a function, which we're going to use here in a second, called obstacles. And this allows me to jump over features. So we're going to do it two different ways as we build the, the program. So what will happen is we're going to take the same part. We're now going to add a center drill. But we're going to center drill on two different planes. So I'm going to hit these four holes. And position patterns, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm just going to do a bolt hole pattern just to kind of show it a little bit to handle these two top holes. But these are on zero; the other ones are down at a half an inch. So if we come into our program, let's bring up our print again. We can now go over to drilling. From here, I always want to set up the cycle first, and then tell it where to drill. So I'm having to have a pre-built center drill here. And the drill was created with a tip angle of 90 degrees. Now, it doesn't matter which angle you have. You're just going to make sure this matches the actual tool. Because what we're going to do is we're going to use the diameter feature. And then diameter, as opposed to tip for depth, diameter will physically go and advance the tool until it reaches a chamfer size or a countersink size of 3 and a quarter, or 3.25. Now, some of the unique features in drilling as opposed to the milling cycles. When you get to the feed rate, it's either inches per minute or it's inches per rev or feed per rev as opposed to feed per tooth. 
the reason why it's VPREV is if you look at any um, any speed and feed charts for drills, this is how the manufacturers are going to give you the, the, the data, because um, really you're only ever drilling off that leading flute of the tool. So the only time that this becomes a little bit of a bummer is if you use a three flute drill. But on a standard standard twist drill, you're, you're given the value of speed per rev, and that's what you can put in here, or you can just give it inches per minute. So in our case, we're going to do five inches a minute, 1200 RPM. We're going to program to the diameter. And the diameter, based on my print here, is telling me to do a countersink of 3.250. Um, this one was called out to be at 90 degrees, which is good. I have a 90 degree cutter. And the dwell is what do I do at the bottom of the hole for each consecutive hole? So sometimes it's nice to just pause for a very split second. Maybe I'm getting a little chatter. Uh, maybe I'm breaking through, but I want to make sure I fully broke through and we got the coolant flush down before I pull the tool out. But just always remember, wherever you see dwell, it's applied at the end of the hole or the depth. We save it. Now, just like you saw in the thread milling, I get this little open-ended bracket. So I now get to give it some locations. So here we're using positions, and we have three different positions. I have the, the random holes, which we're going to use in a second. I have an array, and an array can be linear can be a grid or a frame of holes. So in theory, I could actually use the frame for this part because it's just square. Um, and then we have bolt hole pattern, which we'll use in a second here. So we're doing random holes. Now, if you think back to the cycle I just filled out, nothing asked me where I'm starting to drill from. It just told me what I'm drilling to, basically. That's because this is handled at the cycle level. And you'll see why as we build this right now. So in this case, I'm going to start drilling from negative half an inch down. Then I give it my four holes. So let's say I was going to start in the lower right-hand corner, positive 2, negative 6, 25. Now I'm going to move up to the upper right-hand corner. Now since the X isn't moving, I don't have to give it. I'm just going to give it the Y. Now I'm going to move over my X, negative 2 over. If you gave it the, the non-moving axis, that's okay too. Um, it's not going to hurt us. This is just saving me a little time. So I give it my four locations. So start lower corner, move up to the upper right-hand corner, move over to the left corner, and move down. So we accept it. Now we're going to come back, and we got to do this little bolt hole pattern, this two pattern feature. So I'm immediately going to go back to positions. Now the random holes, you get nine in total. It starts at zero, goes to eight. So if you need more, you can keep adding them, but you'd have to just add a whole new page. So you would just add two or three or four of these pages to handle more than the nine holes normally. But in our case, we're going to do a bolt hole pattern next. And the bolt hole pattern starts at zero because this is doing it from the true top of the part. What is the center of the bolt hole pattern? In our case, it's going to be zero, zero. The starting position of the first hole, I'm going to start it up at 12 o'clock or 90 degrees. What is the radius? So I have a called out diameter of three, so my radius would be inch and a half. How many holes am I doing? And in our case, we're doing two. And then how do I want to position between the holes? So I can position in a straight path or following a radius. So we're going to just do a simple straight path. And I save it. So now, watch what happens as we start to simulate this part. Speed it up a little bit. So we're starting our milling. So it came around and started spotting all the holes. What I want you to see specifically, and we'll delete the path, is look at this groove that's here. So earlier when I created my header, I used this feature called optimized. And optimized says, always move the tool back to its safety distance before it moves to the next location. Well, in this case, my safety distance drove the cutter straight through the side of the part. So this is where there's multiple ways for me to handle this. The obstacle tool will be one way that hopefully we'll get a chance to look at here shortly. But the other, and probably the more common way to handle a feature or function like this, is actually by making the change in the header page. So if you open up your header and you come down to this retract strategy, this is what's controlling that. So that's why it's really important to start to understand what each of these little nuances of these cycles are, because this is where you can, can really control the system. So in our case, I was saying, hey, just back up to the safety distance. Well, it would have been fine had I made it all the way through those holes, then it would have backed up to the next one. But I wasn't all the way through the holes where I had a potential collision. So if I do something simple as say, hey, 
move to the retract point every single time, then it'll keep me above the part because now my retract's going to be a quarter inch above. Now, it's not going to feed down from the retract. It's going to wrap it down. So you don't lose that much time. But if you had some big steps, you could lose some time. But this would be probably the first and the quickest way to handle this type of feature. So here, I can now simulate it, and we should. All right, going around. Now you'll notice with this red line right over there, that's where it's now pulling the tool up all the way to a quarter inch above the part. You can see it right here. We're wrapping across, wrap it back down, drills the hole all the way around. So that's certainly one quick way to start to avoid a scenario like that. It's just you changing your strategy from optimize to retract. Okay. So once we center drill the holes, now we're, we're going to do a couple different operations on the physical holes. So if we go back. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do some drilling and reaming. Um, so the next set of cycles, drill and ream. Um, drill and ream, really almost identical cutter paths or tool paths. The only difference is a drill is going to feed to depth. No chip breakers, none of that stuff. But it's going to then wrap it back out of the hole. A reaming cycle designed more for a physical reamer would feed to depth and feed back out of the hole. Um, so there's not too much here as far as parameters. Uh, the big thing here is I can control my depth either with what we call shank or tip. So shank's kind of handy, and we're going to use that on this example, because if I want to make sure I break through, it will automatically push the drill beyond by whatever the projected tip angle is of that tool. Tip, I would be truly controlling the depth, and that would most likely be the strategy I would use. In fact, reaming only goes to tip. Um, then it's really, where do I want to start? Where do I want to go? Um, you know, do I want to dwell? There's only a couple fields here. So we're going to use this. We're going to use this on the four outside holes. And then we're going to go back and we're going to peck drill. Once we've drilled these four outside holes, we're going to come back and we're going to peck drill the two, the two bigger holes. Okay. So let's jump on over. Back over to Cindy Train, and let's put in some drilled holes. Now, normally you would have been used to us going back and um, putting all the cycles stacked together if I had multiple operations. But in this case, I have different operations on these tools, right? I'm going to drill these holes, but I'm not going to drill with the same tool in this strategy because it's deeper hole. I want to peck drill. So what we're going to do is we're going to play around with kind of how we're we're applying that. So let's go in and let's go drill some holes. So if I go drilling and I pick my drill reaming cycle, now I want to go and get my physical tool. So we're going to use a uh, da -da, 201 drill, which I happen to have down here in my list. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? This would be my tap drill because we're going to tap drill some holes. Speeds and speeds, just like you saw in the last cycle, feed per rev or inches a minute, same thing speed. But now I can control my depth based on either the tip or the shank. So the shank will say, hey, whatever depth you give it now, it's going to make sure it goes beyond by whatever tip angle was assigned when I built this tool. That tool was built with 118 degree tip. So that will allow me to do a, an absolute value of just one inch, and she'll go one inch plus that projected tip angle. Uh, dwell would be at the bottom of the hole. I'm not going to worry about any dwell right here. So we accept it now. Now, in this case, I have to go back and I have to drill these positions. So certainly I could copy and paste those positions down. But now if I ever have to change or make any changes on these positions, it kind of messes me up. I have to edit them in multiple spots. Well, this is where the position repeat function comes in really handy. So the way this works is when I have to start to break up operations like this, I can say, hey, go back and redo. In this case, and what I want to pay attention to is the number of the system assigned to the positions. So in this case, I'm using positions with the number two value here. So if you go position repeat, 
I can just say, hey, go find number two. And you'll notice when I hit number two, these start to highlight. I hit accept. And now this is how it's going to look. So any changes I make up to position two, this is going to automatically handle that because it's just always referring back to those locations when it drills those holes. So if we come in and simulate, now we're going to get the four drilled holes. So if we look at it. We got our four drilled holes. We still have a nice chamfer for a lead in for our tap. And we want to go back and we're going to drill these next tools holes. I didn't get any collision because I'm still retracting back to my retraction plane. So everything's looking good. From here, we're now going to go to a deep hole drilling cycle. So deep hole drilling allows me to really want to do things. I can do a chip breaker or chip removal. So do I want to pull out of the hole every time or do I want to stay in the hole and just break the chip? Um, it can compensate for the tip or the shank. Is I can start to decrease the feeds and my peck amount with these parameters. So we're going to explore that here at this point. So the way I'll use it is we're going to go in, we're going to drill some holes, we're going to select deep hole drill, we'll set up the can cycle, and in this case we'll use the position repeat function again, uh, and we'll go back and we'll grab the bolt hole pattern to keep us from having to uh, repeat these, these functions or those, those, feed, um, those geometry points again. Now, I didn't have a chance to go, we don't have a chance to go through this example, uh, but the boring cycle, that allows us to come in and physically handle boring heads. So the big gain here is not only can I time my tool, but I can do this lift and no lift strategy. Um, and in a lift strategy, it'll pull up the bottom. So I'll show you the cycle real quick as we start to explain it. Um, but obviously, we're not going to apply this one as a real world example. So, and, and then from there, we are going to go in and then look at the tapping cycle. And we'll, uh, we'll physically look at the two different strategies for tapping. And, oh, well, I think I went too far. Yes, I did. Sorry. So we want to go and we want to apply our deep hole drilling. So let's go take a look at the deep hole drill and kind of how it would work on our physical part. So in this case, back in drilling, pick your deep hole. You're going to pick a tool. In this case, I pre-built a quarter-inch drill. And the quarter-inch drill is down here in my list somewhere. There it is. If I was to look at it in the list, I happen to build this one with a 118-degree tip. So if I'm compensating for that tip angle, it's important I put the right one. Feeds and speeds are all the same as you've seen. But here I have two options. So I have chip breaker. So you'll see here in the graph, it didn't fully pull out of the hole. Or I have a chip removal, and then chip removal is going to physically pull out of the hole when it pecks it. I can compensate for my tip or my shank. So in this, this portion on my print, if you look at it, this is a blind hole, and it tells me specifically that the hole would be five-eighths five of an inch deep. So in this case, the strategy would better, better be better off using tip than shank, so I can truly control the overall depth. So in this case, we're going to do five-eighths deep. I'm going to do my first peck at a quarter of an inch. And then we have some modifiers. So my first one, my FD1. So my feed for the drilling on the first feed, I can reduce it. So in this case, if I'm coming in at 10 inches a minute, my first peck, if I said 50%, 50% would be five inches per minute for my first peck. And then from there, I can reduce my peck amount. Now, I don't have a very deep hole, so it wouldn't make sense on this case, but maybe this was a four inch deep hole. Well, I could say reduce my peck amount by 70%, 75%. So it's using 75% of the last one. And then I'm controlling my retract, so it just wants to make sure it's something in there within the depth. And now it's going to keep decrementing my depth per pass. So my first one would be quarter inch. Next one would be a little less, a little less, a little less. In this case, it would be reducing it. Um, so it's using 75% of the last one. So it's actually reducing it by 25%, if that makes sense. Like if it was a 90 thou or a 50 thou, 50% reduction, it would be cutting it in half each time. Okay, we're going to use 100%, so in my case, we'll set it to 100. 
If I retract, I can control the retract value manually. Normally, I'll just let it set to automatic. In this case, it's just going to make sure it backs up by a predefined parameter in the system. And then do I want to dwell at the bottom of the hole? So we hit accept. We use our repeat position again, save us some time. But now I'm repeating positions number three. I just wanted to make sure I call that out. I'm repeating, and again, nice little graphic, and it shows me, if you guys can see it, there's a little orange marker just showing me I'm picking the right one. Now we've come in, and we've, we've positioned or we've drilled those physical holes. Now, we are running a little light on time here, but I'm going to keep going through, so if anybody has to jump off, I can certainly understand, but uh, we'll keep on pushing because there's a little bit more information I certainly want to go through with you guys here. So in this case, if we simulate it, we should now have a fully drilled and milled part up just about. We just have to put some threads in. And that's what we're going to do next. Now, the next set of operations, though, I'm going to show you how to use the obstacle feature. And that's a, another way to kind of get around this whole scenario. So if we, we jump back and we start to take a look at uh, Now, prior to going into the threading, uh, we will take a quick, brief look at the boring. We talked about it a little bit just before. And then we're going to go in and we're going to do some tapping. Now, there are two different tapping strategies. There's a traditional tapping or there's a drill thread milling routine. This is pretty cool. Um, some of the advanced um, advanced uh, cutting tool manufacturers make these tools. Uh, I know Amugi makes a really nice one that I've used in the past. But what the tool does is it'll actually drill the hole and then thread mill the shape. And that's all handled right here within our tapping cycle. So we have a standard cycle that'll accommodate that type of tool. We are going to use the tapping cycle here in a second. Now, one thing is kind of neat, and uh, we're going to use this in the specifically in this example, is a lot of guys think when they pick a strategy, they're kind of locked in, you know, specifically in the header page. They're locked into that for the length of their program. Well, under various and under settings, I can change those strategies, like maybe my retract position midstream. So maybe in the beginning, it's okay to go all the way back to a retract plane, but further down the program, I'm just wasting too much time, let's say. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our strategy midstream, put it back to the optimized, so now we would potentially have a collision scenario. But instead, I'm going to use this obstacle feature that you see right here to get me to jump up over the shape. Now, the only difference here as I start to build it is I will have to break up my positions a little bit. So I'm going to have to have them broken up into two positions and the two positions because this is a physical event. So it won't apply it to all locations. It's going to just apply it between the move between the events. So you'll get to see that right now. So let me jump back in. And we're going to now put a tap in. So when I'm in drilling and I hit thread, these are my two options. So tapping or the thread mill drill cycle. So if I pick tapping, now I'm just going to fill out the physical tapping cycle. Now when you build a tap, and I do have one pre-created for us here, quarter tap, but uh, I'm just going to load it up in the magazine for now. But when you build a tap, one of the things you do have to give it that's unique is you have to give it the pitch. And this always kind of goofs guys up. So what happens is the value you enter here is specific to whatever unit of measure the control is sitting in. So what unit of measure is the control sitting in right now? Well, if I came back over to my machine, I see I'm in inch mode. As opposed to under my settings screen, right, I can switch her to metric mode. So the value in the tool table, it doesn't know what you're doing in the part program. How could it? It only knows what's, what the system's in. So when I'm in inch, this is my threads per inch value. In this case, 20 for 20 threads per inch. If I was in metric, this would be the physical pitch. It's a one millimeter, half a millimeter, two millimeter, whatever that physical pitch is. Now you gotta make sure when you're building a tap that the value you set up here, when you go to actually create the cycle in the program is gonna match whatever the numbers are 
in the physical tapping cycle. If you get any discrepancy here, it will give you an alarm and tell you that you can't do that operation with that tool. So we pick the tool. You can use a table. We have some predefined tables. I don't use it a lot because uh, unfortunately we don't have fine. We only have um, UN, UN course. We don't have the UN fine here. Um, all the metrics are certainly covered. Um, but typically I'll find myself coming down and then just, just defining my pitch value. So again, we looked at this briefly before, but you have a few options. So starting with a metric pitch, you can do tell it an inch physical pitch. You can tell it the number of threads per inch, or you can do a module thread. So in our case, I wanted to do my threads per inch. Now, when doing threads per inch, we do have a fraction here. So if I don't have a fraction being applied to this thread feature, then just cancel it by giving it a zero value. Uh, if this was 20 and a half threads per inch, then I would type 20, one slash uh, 100. But in our case, it's just going to be the 20. Now, if I set this up as my pitch value of any of these values, as long as the mathematically the numbers jive with 20 threads per inch on my tool table, it's not going to care. It's if any of these numbers don't line up, that's where there's a problem. Now, when tapping, I can program a in-feed RPM, and then I can program a different RPM in my retract. So a lot of times, you know, it's nice to be able to speed up when I'm pulling out of the hole. We can handle with or without compensating chuck is rigid tapping or soft tapping. So without a compensating chuck is a very fancy way of saying rigid tapping. Compensating chuck we're referring to is a floating tap holder. So if you are soft tapping, you've got to pick with compensating chuck. Now you'll notice the minute I pick with compensating chuck as opposed to the other one, I lose this field. And that's because we can only do peck tapping or chip break tapping in a rigid tapping machine. But do yourself a favor. If you're going to rigid tap, make sure you're using a real rigid tap holder and collet, or at least a collet with a square driver for the tap. If you try to take the tap and just tighten it up, I guarantee you it's going to slip, and you're going to either pull the threads or break the tap. That's just standard machining practice. So in our case, I can do any one of these three strategies. I'm just going to do a one cut, give it the depth. I want to make sure I get all the way through my hole. I give it that here. So we fill out the cycle. We hit accept. We now have the, you know, it's looking for the two information. Now what I was going to do just prior to this cycle, I got a little ahead of myself, is I did want to change my strategy for my retract. So that's under various and settings. So the settings button allows me to get to a lot of the stuff, like blanks in here, my clamping types in here. So just about everything I have up in the header page, I can change midstream, including how it's handling, maybe even where I, what my safety distance is. So maybe I'll change my safety distance to even 50,000, even closer towards the part. So the way this works is just make the changes you want, hit accept, and it's going to save it as a settings event. So now, if I was to just repeat the four holes, it would drive that tap right through the side of that feature. So the way I use the obstacle is this. I'm going to go in and I'm going to give the system two positions. So I'm going to tell it, I'm going to do my lower, lower right corner and move up. But I now got to get rid of my other two holes and I save it. So this is going to drill, if I take a look at the print, this is going to tap, in this case, these two right holes. Now, back in positions, if I pick obstacle, I can tell it, hey, I want to retract on the move between these two sets of positions up one inch. And it's kind of a one-shot deal. And this could be any value. I certainly want it positive. I'm just going to make it an inch so it looks big. So you save it, and you get this obstacle event. So now I'm going to go and go back to position. We're now going to say, okay, we're now going to do a the lower left and maybe upper right. So I'm just going straight across over. And then once I'm there, I'm going down. Oops, minus 1.65, going down to my lower corner. So I save it. We have 
all of our locations spelled out. If we go to simulate, we should now get a tapping strategy that still doesn't clip the part, but it's now going to, whoops, sorry. So that was my tap. Let me rerun this for us. So we're gonna, I'm gonna use the delete path to kind of clean up things a little bit. If you just took the show path off and on, it brings back all the geometry. The delete path is saying, you know, hey, I'm gonna get rid of the rest of it, but keep my show path on. I like to see the show path when we're playing around with how the tool physically moves. It certainly gives you a little bit better visual. So there's our trichoidal, trichoidal milling, our slot milling. There's our finish for our slot or our semi-finish. There's our thread mill. Now we're spot drilling. Now there's our tapping. Oh, nope, we're still drilling. And here's your tapping. So there you see I got a nice tight retract. Right, I'm only backing up 50 thou. And this is your obstacle move right here. I jump all the way up to one inch, come all the way down, and I continue on. So just you know, two different two different ways to handle an obstacle like this. You know, if I'm doing a whole lot on one side and a whole lot on the other, and it's just an obstacle because there's a clamp or something else, the obstacle tool is the way to go. Um, if I'm bouncing around quite a bit, jumping on either side of features, then I would probably use the uh, retract to the, you know, the the retract instead of the optimized feature. You kind of kind of have to make the decision based on the part. But I certainly wanted to give you a, a couple different methods or strategies here. So I know we're certainly over the hour and a half. Um, I do have a little bit more to show if you guys want to hang on. I see uh, everybody's actually been hanging on real, real good here. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to then take what you've seen and show you some of the unique things that you could use if you were methodizing a four axis part. Um, I had planned on programming it out for you, but I was afraid I was going to run a little, little long on time. Sometimes I get a little wordy in this stuff. But just to show you, and actually we're going to show you here in this next slide anyway, this would be a part, um, if we methodized it, where maybe I'm milling some flats, drilling some holes, but now I'm using A-axis commands because this is a fourth axis. So I've pre-programmed this. Why don't we spend a, a few minutes, if you guys would like, um, just kind of showing you some of the the features in here that work with the standard cycles that support the A-axis, um, and then we can uh, open it up to any questions that may still be here. So some of the things we're going to show you is, one, that clamping feature, and that's critical when trying to set up four and potentially five-axis simulation when you get to a five-axis machine. So in this case, I would tell it what rotary I'm going to have the part clamped about, and that's what then allows me to get four-axis simulation to become enabled. Now what you'll see when I'm handling four axis from a drilling routine is we, if the machine's commissioned for it, mind you, we have the ability now of selecting the, the axis that I'm, I'm applying for the drilling pattern. So in this case, a simple bolt hole pattern, I can do it about my A axis, an XA bolt hole pattern. If I needed to do some drilling off center line a little bit, like this part does, I can use this XYA features and then I can kind of work that way. And then after that, we're going to show you a, a unique feature called cylinder surface transformation. Um, now this is an option that would be required, but what's neat about cylinder surface trans is it allows me to take anything two-dimensionally programmed and wrap it around a bar or a cylinder and turn that cutter path into really a four-axis cutter path. So we're going to take a simple pocket and wrap it around the shape. So if you look back at the print I showed you real briefly, we have a pocket, right, a slot or a pocket that is wrapped around, this is a sectional view, wrapped around this feature. Now, the only thing that's a little tricky when you get into programming this is you need to know this formula right here because the y-axis isn't an angular value, right? The cycle itself doesn't know it's being wrapped. That's happening in the back end. So when I go into and program this as a pocket, I'm, I'm programming it like it's flat. So if you can visualize, you know, I'm drawing this out on a piece of paper, and then I'm taking the pad paper and wrapping it around my part. Same concept. So the value I need in Y is actually the arc length. That's the chordal length, right, this arc length on this radius. So this would be the, the formula for figuring out arc length. It's the diameter. In this case, we're wrapping about, so like a 4-inch diameter, 
times pi, 3.1415, times the angle divided by 360. So once I do this formula, that gives me the length, and that's what I would input as the y value. So you're going to get a chance to see that here. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to Sinutrain, but in this case, because we have run a little long, I'm just going to bring up a pre-done program and just show you some of the, the features. So one of the first things when you start to do four-axis um, programming, especially in Chopmill, I have to tell it that clamping. So this is where I would pick either table or A axis. Once it's picked A axis, now my cylinder, instead of, and actually all of my features, instead of being able to be oriented in the Z direction, it's now oriented, in this case, in the A, or aligned with X. Now I give it a diameter, starting zero, ending zero. You know, these would be the parameters of certainly of my part shape, and we can hit accept. Other than that, all the variables are going to apply the same. Now, one of the things to note is you're typically in the scenario like this going to work from the center of the bar. So the center of the bar is actually Z0, not the top edge. Um, it could be the top edge, but you'd have to do some extra steps. It's typical to work from the middle. So with that being said, you're going to do things like use a retract plane that's kind of outside here a little bit. So I'm retracting a three because the outside edge is really at two inches. So if I had a retract of inch and a half, that would be inside the part. So just keep that in mind when you start to work around with bar stock like this that, uh, and I just got to bring my print up a little bit, make sure it stays on top, that you, uh, you're working from the middle of the feature. So once I've done that, now you kind of pick what you're going to do. So in this little program, I wanted to drill my bolt hole pattern first, but my bolt hole pattern is around the A. So I'm going in, and I used, um, just because I had the drill and tap, I used that drill thread mill, that thriller tool. So in this case, this would be kind of how the cycle looks a little bit. Um, you build the tool. The tool's not really all that, that fancy. Um, it is an option in the list. So if you were to build the tool, it's uh, underneath cutters. So I'd like to give you an example. Uh, I'll bring mine up there. But if I was building that drill thread mill tool, it can be found, sorry, be found right under doo -doo 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 -doo, cutters, and then it's right here, drill thread cutter. There's not a lot of information that's needed here. Um, in fact, really there's less than a tap because I'm just going to tell it, you know, a, a tool length, my uh, diameter of the cutter, and then a uh, number of flutes if I had a number of flutes. Um, and that's, that's, that's the tool physically as far as what we need to know. Now, inside the program, there's a little bit more information that's needed. Um, certainly my speeds and speeds like we normally would have. What am I drilling the physical depth to? So that would be, you know, controlled by my part print. If I want to peck drill or not, a physical, uh, my depth or pass, if I want to decrement my peck. Then you can tell it if you want it to spot it or not, so it'll take the tool to a quick spot before it starts drilling. Um, and then there's also a, a feature for this drill thread functionality. Um, I'm not quite sure how that applies. I haven't really used it too much myself. I can control whether I'm doing a chip breaker or not. And then they tell it kind of like the thread milling. So it's kind of a combination of the drilling and the thread mill cycle. So the parameters on the bottom are, are really about the same parameters that you saw in the thread milling cycle. But now, once I've created the can cycle, when I go to bolt hole pattern, as long as I choose, instead of my typical XY, as long as I choose XA, I can revolve the bolt hole pattern around a given cylinder. Additionally, when you get to features like pockets, right, here I have three flats I got to put on this part. Well, now, I can come in, I can use a feature like position pattern, I can program out one basic pocket routine, but now link it to my positions with an X, Y, A, and now I'm going to give it the center of each pocket and where the pocket exists in relation to A. 
So is it at zero? Is it at 120? Is it at 240? And I kind of go right around, right around the clock as I go. And then from there, you know, let's say I wanted to just start to show you this a little bit. Now, a neat little trick is you start to maybe debug programs. You can throw in an M30, and that will work as an end of program. So that'll keep it from trying to run the rest of the part program. So in our case here, we're drilling and thread milling this bolt hole pattern right around the shape. And then we're going to mill one flat, mill the next flat. Now, be careful when starting to utilize features like this. Um, I like to give it a few redundant commands, specifically the y-axis, because it's going to use the last position of the y as far as what it's revolving about. So if, if I don't stage the y properly when I go into some of these switch, these milling features, I might find things start to drift. So like for argument's sake, if I had just left, oops, left the y blank, Oh, I need this one for the first one, yeah. If I left the Y blank on these two, and we start to simulate it, you might find that it starts shifting. Um, so what's happening is it's staging the rotary, but if the Y is not there, it thinks that that's Y center. So just uh, certainly worth worth noting. So here, stereo you how oh, this one might... Uh, you can't really. Now, this one was okay. But anyhow, um, certainly I have a tendency when I get the four axis to give it um, more information than, than less information. Uh, certainly will save you in uh, a lot of pain down the road. Okay, so we've, uh, we've milled some flats. Now I wanted to drill on these flats, right? I have, I've called out two three-eighths holes, but per flat all the way around. So this is a case where I'm going to go back into the drilling cycle right here. And then I'm going to link it to the same feature I just used. But now on this case, I'm going to have two coordinate positions per A rotation. So I have my first position, which is X minus one, and I'm down a half an inch. And then I'm going to go up a positive half an inch. Then we rotate to the next flat, to the next two, next flat, to the next two. And that will allow me to start handling drilling on those offset sides. So we'll just uh, put a quick little M30. So now everything you'll have seen here should be standard in any machine equipped with the fourth axis. Um, there's no extra licensing needed um, if your machine doesn't have that A option, it just wasn't turned on properly. So that can be added. I would certainly suggest talking to the OEM. They may or may not be supporting it. But just note, it isn't an option as far as that. It just has to be set up. Now, um, depending on the vintage of the control, um, you may seem find there's uh, differences as far as what was there. But we've supported this. Everything you've seen here, we've supported for quite a long time. So here we got our bolt hole pattern, we got our four features, and we got our four holes. And what's cool is this is a, uh, it's a nice area to kind of start to see the cut function within graphics. So like, let's say um, these were ports, right? And I wanted to make sure they're not breaking all the way through. Well, now we can actually section the part right here. And we can start to see based on, like we see it in our lower right hand view of our print, we can start to see oh, there's our drilled holes. They're not breaking through. So if this was some kind of a porting, we would know that we wouldn't be getting the port into the next channel. So the cut function, when I start to deal with especially a lot of this, this internal features, becomes really handy. And I got to cut by just going into details and hitting cut. OK, so we've created some flats utilizing some of these four axis features, drilled some holes. So now we have the cylinder surface trans. And cylinder surface transformation uh, does require an optional license. But what it allows you to do is it allows you in the cycle to then take anything that was set. There we go. Didn't refresh. Uh, in a two-dimensional plane and wraps it around some kind of a cylinder. 
So the way I get to this cylinder service transformation cycle is it's found under the various button and under transformations as called cylinder surface trans. So here I just stage my part, kind of clock my, my rotary, stage my tool up and centered. I turn my surface transformation on, and now I can take any two-dimensional features, all these can cycles you just saw, and the difference is anything related to Y is that, that arc length. So I do have to do a little bit of math there, but that now gives me the ability of starting to do more complex features in certainly in a uh, simple shop mill conversational factor. So in my case here, we'll let this program run through completion. And you're going to get to see a couple things. So we get to see the pocket. And then what I even did on this one was I did some engraving. And what's cool with the engraving is if I have cylinder surface transformation on, I can even wrap engraving around a bar. So there's my pockets, and I see it's shooting normal to that surface radius. And then we get some engraving. So it's even wrapping the engraved text right around the bar. All right, well, I know I went way over. Uh, there's actually, I still even had more, but uh, thanks uh, for everybody joining. Um, if there are any questions, certainly by all means, you can fire them out. I'm not in any rush. Um, if, uh, if you have anything, we'll open it up now. Um, if you have to jump off, I absolutely appreciate it. I appreciate everybody hanging on as long as you guys did. This was, uh, this was a good one. So if you have any questions, feel free. I'm actually, uh, while we're doing this, I'm gonna stop the recording. All right, recording is stopped. Oh, there you go.